Emmy award-winning journalist, television personality, author, producer, philanthropist, and girls empowerment activist, Sean Robinson is a true role model. I've experienced a relationship with Sean through her personal foundation work, the Sean Foundation. I've witnessed her excellence on television and in movies, and I'm thrilled to have a conversation with her now. Sean, I'm so happy to enjoy this time with you. And I think our family listening is going to really learn a lot from this conversation. Now, when I appeared on your podcast before COVID, your questions were deep and showed an awareness of life and communities outside of what most people would think you would have. I mean, most people see you as living a very glamorous, albeit successful life on your own merit. Your life and career are amazing in ways that you give back that I think are even more incredible. I want to jump right in on the Sean Foundation. There's a lot we're going to talk about. I just think at the beginning of this year, uh, people are considering how they can make this year meaningful. And I found meaning through being connected with Sean Foundation. Can you talk a little bit about it? Absolutely, Janice. And first of all, let me say it is an honor to be talking with you on your podcast. As you know, I'm a little bit of a fangirl when it comes to you. So uh, to be uh, for this conversation to be flipped and you to be interviewing me, it is quite fun and exciting. I'm looking forward to our conversation. And I'm so glad you started it off with my foundation, the Sean Foundation for Girls, which uh, you have been a wonderful, wonderful supporter of. Um, you know, I, I always take it back when I talk about my foundation, I take it back to my parents, my grandparents, who always told me, if God gives you a platform, use it to give back to others. And I come from a family of philanthropists, and I'm not talking about philanthropists in terms of money, because my family did not have a lot of money at all, but I'm talking about philanthropy in the sense of giving back to others and make, making sure that you are helping others with your time, uh, with your energy, with whatever resources that you might have. Now, you could stop by my grandmother's house uh, and get some uh, peach preserves that she uh, she canned herself. My mom was always there uh, counseling young people. And my just my family, my, my mother's father um, became a pillar in his community by um, starting a drug treatment facility in outside of Detroit in Highland Park. And just as so many um, of my relatives, my ancestors have been in the, um, the space of giving back to others. And so I spent 16 years on the entertainment show, Access Hollywood. And after um, that chapter came to an end, I was looking at what additional chapters were going to be a part of my life. And I don't say next chapters because I don't have like, I never have like one thing going on. I have a ton of things going on. And I always wanted to have my own nonprofit. And I began to think about the space that I wanted to be in. And what was natural to me was a girl empowerment and empowering you know, girls and young women to excel, to strive, to have strong self-esteem and to have the, the resources that they need to have successful lives. And so I started the Sean Foundation for Girls back in 2016. And we have, um, have just been, I, I've been really blessed with uh, learning about so many nonprofits, small nonprofits that we support that are doing amazing things in the areas of um, empowering our girls. And so um, that's what it's all about. That's what it has always been about for my family, just giving back and using the platform that you have to help others. Well, you know, you inspire another question. And although I do want to talk about your, your childhood and growing up, because I'm sure that helped frame who you are in a dynamic way. Sean, the, I, I have to say, you know, an event that I attended for Sean Foundation was so full of love. It was also full of awareness and teaching. And I left there thinking the power of one plus. Every woman there 
was talking about how she felt her support of Sean Foundation added to the support of others was making incredible impact in the communities you serve. You determined to help those organizations that already do it really well. And when we got the data back on how that was exponentially impacting, it blew my mind to see you here, naturally with joy and pride speaking about Sean Foundation, doing that with the with the calm you have. Girl, I'm jumping up and down about, wow, my little bit helped do this and helped do this and helped do this. Yeah. We're starting a year out where people actually can feel that joy I have about how they are helping other people whose lives aren't quite so joyful. The impact you're making, can you share with us just how exponentially people's contributions, and I'm talking resources now in terms of money, make a big impact. Yes. Um, so let me give you a statistic, uh, Janice. In, in five years, after a nonprofit starts, five years later, 80% of nonprofits fail, okay? <laughs> and the reason that they fail is not because they don't have the desire, that they don't have, you know, the, the plan, uh, that they don't know exactly what they want to do, but they, they fail because they don't have the resources to continue their mission. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and certainly there are, you know, some other factors, but the main reason that nonprofits fail in the first five years, 80% is because of lack of resources. Um, so what I wanted to do Think of the Sean Foundation for Girls as, as sort of like uh, the United Way for girls, underserved and underrepresented girls and young women, predominantly girls of color. And what I wanted to do is I knew there were, because I'm a journalist and I've researched these things like, you know, I, I do tons and tons of research before I take a step. I knew there were a lot of nonprofits out there that were doing incredible work that had the, you know, the people on board, they had the mission, they had everything in place and the desire to help um, uh, girls and also the expertise to help girls. And how could I help them? That's what I decided. How can I help the people who are already the boots on the ground that may, you know, meet, you know, have that desire, but they need those resources. So what I have gathered and what you have been a part of is this amazing village of women and men too, that have come together, that have, have you know, pulled our resources together to help these organizations thrive. It could be something, so many organizations come to me, Janice, and they say, gosh, you know, we just need you know, a thousand dollars so we can get a website up and running so that we can hire a CPA to get our taxes done. So we can, you know, get some, um, uh, uh, you know, pay the, pay the rent, you know, all of these things. And so my job with the Sean Foundation for Girls, um, a big part of what we do is we, we find those organizations that are doing that amazing work and we help them with their capacity building. We help them with their, with their uh, projects and programs. Also though, you know, we, one of the, one of the, as you know, because you are a businesswoman extraordinaire, Janice, you know that what, what you have to, for any business and a nonprofit is a business. It's a business to help others. You have to have a strong foundation. And a lot of times what nonprofits will, will run into is that when they are getting a grant from someone, a company, a corporation, a foundation, it is project-based. The people say, okay, I want this money to go directly to a project. And the toughest thing for nonprofits to get are unrestricted funds, okay? And unrestricted funds, and you might have, uh, uh, Mackenzie Scott Gay has recently given a number of unrestricted grants to 
incredible nonprofit organizations. And the reason unrestricted grants are so important is because they help the infrastructure of the business, you know, they help, you know, pay the light bill, <laughs> they help get the IT running, they help with those, those things that you need to make a strong nonprofit. And so what I do, the Sean Foundation for Girls, we, we help in many different areas. It could be unrestricted funds, it could be funds going to specific projects, it could be capacity building funds, but whatever that organization needs to thrive, that's how I, I hope to help a lot of the nonprofits around the country. It, it, it fills my heart to see what you're doing because, you know, so many not-for-profit organizations are also not heavily established, but they are well entrenched in the communities. You talked about vetting your organizations around their expertise to assist girls. They are assisting girls. They're also assisting people unique to the communities they live in. And so it just, it blew me away that a thousand dollars given to Sean Foundation can do $10,000 worth of work. And it, 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 it really blows me away. I, I could talk forever about it. I do want to, though, have our family understand a little bit about how this beautiful creature in front of us came forward. And I, I, I know that, um, let's take it back. So um, you grew up in Detroit and oh, you may know. Yeah, you may know that I had the privilege of guest speaking at Cass Tech, and I was blown away with the excellence of that school. Not just the people who've come out of the school who we know about, but the impact of the school on the world in ways we don't know about, and especially unique uh, to Detroit. You attended there, and I imagine that that, along with the guidance of your parents, pretty much impacted the ideals that you've just been expressing that are, 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 are being fulfilled by your work outside of how we know you as a professional, uh, decisions you made early on. What was that childhood like? So uh, thank you. I'm so excited to learn that you uh, went to my alma mater, Cass Technical High School, to speak CT, CT. You've been so good to me. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> That's uh, hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, so uh, Cass Tech was, uh, Cass Tech High School was or is a magnet school. So you had to have a certain grade point average to get in. I come from the Northwest side of Detroit, Michigan. You know, my parents uh, have always emphasized the importance of education. My father worked for the health department. My mother worked for the city wall water department, you know, blue collar family. And, um, you know, they always taught me that it was, you know, education came first and it would open the door to so many opportunities. So I was, uh, I got into Cass Tech and there were 4,000 students at Cass. That's how big the school was. Right. And there were a thousand in my graduating class. And um, so I went there and, and we had to pick curriculums because it really was a college prep high school. And so we had curriculums. My curriculum was performing arts. Okay. <laughs> so we did, uh, you know, we put on plays. We did, you know, anything that was related to the arts was, um, you know, was part of our my curriculum that, that I took. And yeah, I remember going, uh, I remember the first day in, uh, in homeroom class, it was our first day, ninth grade, we're ninth graders. And the, the homeroom teacher, Mr. Kraft, he was trying to kind of show off to us kids. And he said, um, he said, Diana Ross was in my homeroom class. Mm -hmm. like, oh, really? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You know, tell us about her. And I don't know if this story is true or not. I actually asked Diana Ross about this. She said she didn't remember. But at the time when we were ninth graders, uh, Mr. Kraft said, uh, "Yeah, she was in her. She was in our my class, and she was filing her fingernails." And he went over to her and he said, "Miss Ross, did you do your homework?" And she said, "Mr. Kraft, I don't have to do my homework because I'm going to be a star." And he said, 
ha, ha, ha. And <laughs> he said she came back years later and said, ha, ha, ha. Now, it's interesting. My first uh, week or two weeks at Access Hollywood, I interviewed Diana Ross and I asked her about that story. And she said, well, you know what? I don't actually remember that. She said, but she did remember Mr. Kraft. So it's it's a mis mystery, but but what the reason that I that that story is so funny and that I tell us because we had as soon as we came in this class there were these expectations of us that we mm -hmm. were going to do something big we had to okay mm -hmm. we had to beat Diana Ross okay mm -hmm. so um, you know they put you know a lot of emphasis on literature or the arts in my curriculum there are a number of different uh, curriculums at the school. But it was just, uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience. We, um, you know, while we were in high school, it was, there was never a time when I ever thought that there was something that I could not achieve, mm -hmm. that there weren't any limitations for me. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, we knew that we could be doctors, lawyers, we could be heads of corporations. We knew that. And, and you had the evidence of it having come through the same channels you were coming through. Because I've heard you often say these girls need to see it so they can believe it. Yes. You see it, you can be it, you know. And yes. sometimes we have to see it in our own heads. But when you're able to see it coming through the way, and I'm sure there are students who are being phenomenally impacted by what you're doing right now, who are having those same stories told about Sean Robinson. So. <laughs> I, I, I'm quite hey, sure of that. Uh -huh. Hey, 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 Sean. Um, when we talk about your parents, although they were divorced, they've made friends and set some brilliant examples for you. Yes. 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 My father passed away in 2015, and I miss him every single day. But when he did pass away, he and my mother lived right down the street from each other, on the same um, th three blocks down from each other, on the same street. And when my stepmother was alive. My father's second wife, she lived in the middle, in the second block, right? So, so I would, when I would go home, I would visit my mom. I'd walk down the street, visit my stepmom, walk down the street, <laughs> visit my dad. So just yeah. a street of love, a street yes, full of love. Yes. yes, and you know, right up until the time, uh, you know, when my father passed away, my mother, um, who you know had married. Uh, a second time and to a wonderful man, my stepfather, who um, is, is no longer with us, but everybody got along. You know, my father could come mm -hmm. down to the house with my mother and my stepfather, no drama. My mother would take care of, and still today is very, very close to my stepmother's son, who is also my father's son. I mean, I live, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a family where all the steps get along. So mm -hmm. it's always kind of interesting when I hear all the, this step family drama because I did not have that. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank goodness I did not have that when I was growing up. There was just love, and you know, it was about this was this is our extended family. The steps are a part of our extended family. You know, often I have people shocked that I can be from the south, from a huge family, one mom, one dad and that we all get along and are each other's best friends. And I think part of that-ness about you uh, is why I became so engaged and so, and, and, and I sit here, you talk about fangirling. I fangirl about who you are because the things you do that you don't quote unquote have to do, you see it as things you have to do. Do you think the proper role modeling that your parents and your community were showing you influenced why you're so involved in charities that are actually helping children? Yes, you know, and I go back to what I said earlier, my parents just expected you to be involved in helping the lives of other people. I mean, it just even to this day, it's, um, it, you know, it's just, it's just like the air that we breathe. And so when I run into someone who has no affiliation with any kind of charity, doesn't do any charity work, hasn't thought about charity work, I go, mm, okay, maybe this isn't the conversation for me. I am more mm -hmm. drawn to people who have a philanthropic side to them, whether, you know, mm -hmm. it's helping out um, another organization or supporting a cause. You have to be passionate about 
helping the lives of other people. I think that's the only reason that we're here. And so, yeah, you know, learning that from my parents, learning that from my grandparents, um, you know, set me on the path to creating my own foundation today. Well, I, I do think that um, it's important for people to understand, and maybe we didn't say this clearly. I think I referenced a thousand dollars in Sean Foundation. You know, that's ten thousand dollars. Now that's me talking. That's not a. Let me just say that's not data provided by Sean Foundation. Okay, uh, but we have a vast audience. Uh, we call our family, and I think it's important for them to understand that $2,500 to show and foundation can go a long way. They don't have to be the $50,000, $100,000 checks, although they are very welcome. You've created a foundation that individuals can be a part of without having a corporate stamp of approval behind them that brings the big numbers. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up um, about, and you've even sort of given me, given me a new way to explain how our impact affects other organizations. Because, you know, I go back to what I said about these organizations. You know, I think sometimes we're living so up here that we mm -hmm. forget that there are people who $500, $1,000, that makes a big difference to their operating budget. OK, mm -hmm. it makes a very mm -hmm. big difference. And, mm -hmm. you know, even when organizations come to me and they want me to give them a grant, I look sometimes, you know, I do the work, I do the research and I'm like, gosh, your website needs some sprucing up. OK, uh, what are your, are your financials in order? And there are we're talking about people who once again, these are boots on the ground people. These yeah, people who have five hundred dollars might be an outside audit for them to help yes. them make sure they they are operating effectively, or right. or they are operating in line with regulation. Absolutely, and so just learning, helping them learn about IRS rules. I mean, that you know, I still learn about mm -hmm. rules today, and I've been I've had my foundation for over five years, and I still learn about rules that um that you know i did not realize and i fortunately have a team that helps me but a lot of people don't so right. when you talk about you know uh, a certain amount you know can a 25 dollar donation to the sean foundation for girls make a difference yes it can make a difference i mean think of it this way janice when you give a hundred dollars to the american cancer society that $100 has not cured cancer, but it is the community of support, the many $100 that the American Cancer Society gets that allows them to do the research and, um, and developing, helping you know, to develop medications and treatments to help and get education out there for people who have cancer. So you think of it that way, um, you know, will will a hundred dollars, you know, change the world? Well, yeah. If we're all <laughs> doing our part to change the world, it will. And I listen. Some listen. If on my website, on the Sean Foundation for Girls .org website, if you give us five hundred dollars, or I'm sorry, mm -hmm. if you give us five dollars, if you give us a five dollar donation, you get your name on our website in our village of superstars because you are a superstar to me because you took the time to write a check. So yes, any donation at all, we take it, we're glad, and we list you as one of our-, our Oh my stars. goodness, girl, you are you are building beaches from grains of sand. I, I, just, I just think it's amazing. And um, you know your book, Exactly As I Am, um, like you, is beautiful. And I don't just speak the physical. I'm talking about that inner person you're sharing with us right now. Sean, how did your book come about, about and what made you need to share those amazing messages in book form? So um, my book, Exactly As I Am, came out in 2009. And so if you think about back then, social media was not the way it is today, okay? Um, 
I would get letters, let, written letters at the studio where I was working about from girls who were asking, are the stars that they see on TV as you know, beautiful as they look on the screen or are they as perfect? Are they as skinny as they, I mean, you know, just all of these messages that these girls get. And so I thought I would use my access, if you will, to celebrities Mm -hmm. to talk to them about, you know, what is, what has been the true path to self-esteem for them. And it doesn't come from how much money you make. It doesn't come from how pretty you are. It doesn't come from anything other than, um, as Oprah said in my book, you are valuable because you were born, okay? Mm-hmm. And God mm-hmm. made you special and there's something unique about all of us. So that's like one portion. The celebrity interviews are one portion. And then I also talk to women uh, who are pioneers in their profession. I talked to like a female pilot, a female FBI agent, a female firefighter, women who are in male dominated fields. I talked to them about what their challenges have been and how do they walk into their space knowing that they are one of few. But the real heart and soul of my book, exactly as I am, are the girls, are the teen girls that I talked to around the country. I held these uh, task for I held these task force groups around the country of girls talking about uh, their feelings of self-esteem and why they feel like they can't measure up. And I remember talking to this young girl. She was um, she was 15. I think she was 15 years old. She um, she had a baby by a guy that she said was the first guy who ever told her she was pretty Mm -hmm. and she slept with him. And got pregnant. And of course, you know, he disappeared. Okay. And she she was not pretty no more. (laughs) Yeah, right. You know, raising this child. She said, she said her dad had never told her she was pretty. And so there was nobody in her family who even told her that she was a pretty girl. And so she she grew up just really craving that attention. And so, you know, you hear stories like that, but you also hear the triumphant stories about overcoming these feelings of self-esteem. So yes, um, I'm I'm due for a sequel. And since you mentioned it, mentioned the book, I think that is my, that's my signal to work on a sequel to exactly as I am. Yes, it is. It truly is. And Sean, you know, we've got to think about also, and we can do this direct if you like, we need to think about how to get your book into the schools in a deliberate way. I think it's really important. And in your sequel, I think addressing, um, People who identify as male or female can be really helpful because what you're doing for girls, you're doing for boys. When when, when you raise healthy girls, you're creating communities where healthy boys learn to live. I've often said I learned what I could expect of love by the way my mother and my father loved one another. So I, I, I think what you're doing is phenomenal. You know, you work with people who are experts at helping girls, who are professionals at that, as are you. What are some of the challenges you think that are different struggles for girls today than they were when you were at Castag? We won't even go back to when I was in school, way back. Just yeah. when you were at, what are the, I mean, there's the, their issues may be the same, but their struggles are different, whether it's whether it's social media, devices, finances, what's the difference? What are you seeing? Uh, Yeah, I I would say, um, you know, listen, social media can be a very uh, beneficial tool. And I mean, we've heard the the stories about girls just um, feeling bullied online. Um, there, There are a lot of hurt people on social media. And as we know, hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And I think that girls are still getting images uh, that eat away at their Um, Mm self-esteem. You know, I body image is one um, pressure to be adults before they're ready to be adults. Um, I think that that is a huge, huge issue for girls. 
um, girls being told that, you know, uh, in my book, Exactly As I Am, I had an interview with India Ari and she she said, um, um, there is, uh, I was told there wasn't a place for me in this world. So I made my own place. I made a space for the everyday girl. And I want her to know that my money maker is not my body, it's my mind. Mm -hmm. And girls have to know that is not, it's not their bodies that, you know, have, uh, that are to be, that, 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 that are to be shamed. Their bodies should not be shamed. Their bodies, you know, sh they should be um, to walk in confidence. Um, I think those are, those are many of the issues and I could get like really deep. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like how deep to get into this conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that social media is a huge, huge issue for the self-esteem of girls. Also, you know, I did, uh, I was, I was granted, I was very thankful from the Ford Motor Company, the Ford Fund, uh, a grant, several grants to do human trafficking awareness events. Um, mm -hmm. And we did them on, in, in five cities, we did one here in LA, one in my hometown of Detroit. We did one on the campus of Spelman, my al alma mater. Mm -hmm. um, we did one at Fisk and one at Texas Southern. And Janice, I tell you, with each one, I learned something new about the trafficking of girls. Now, we think of trafficking as something that happens in other countries, but no, it's happening right here in our neighborhoods, happening every day in homes uh, with two parents, okay, where a girl can be trafficked in her own home. And I think that that, you know, is a big problem that is, you know, we, you know, I want the Sean Foundation for Girls to really make an impact in 2023 about helping uh, save girls from, from, from trafficking. Um, that's a huge issue, I find. And digitization of images has, I imagine, expanded how people traffic and it can reach into homes with yes. very nice dresses. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, there is a young woman, uh, Chevelle Franklin, who I talked with uh, recently on podcast, Sean, and she was sharing how, and you may know her for her music, okay? Everybody knows her voice from Miss the Love of Man, Shaba, Shaba. Yes. Okay, they know yes. her voice, yes. but she left a very successful uh, uh, career in, um, in non gospel music for gospel music. And she was sharing how horrible her existence was as a kid. At four years of age, she asked someone to take her home with them. Who did? The lady did and helped her until she was 15. Chevelle told me she'd never even had her mother say she loved her, let alone a father. Yeah. I, I think about I think about that. Many of the many of the girls you're helping aren't that disparate in their need. Many of them are getting help that would be more palatable for people to touch and feel who don't want to see the ugly side, but there's some ugly side under there that you're addressing. And I'm so grateful to you for it. Yes. Um, Thank you. Let's shout out some HBCU love though, because you did mention Spellman and you know, I'm from North Carolina A&T and you're right. Uh, okay. I um, like my A. In front of my G, in front of my G, in front of my I, in front of my E, Aggie. Wait, how how's the end go? You had a wider choice of universities that you could attend than I did, and that many others did. You chose Spelman. Yes. Uh, many of our HBCUs choose our students based on economics, and then they develop them into incredible incredible, you know, incredibly learned people. You chose Spellman. Explain why you chose Spellman and describe Spellman to our family. Sean, remember, people are listening to you across Europe, across Africa. The majority of the people listening to you right now are under 35 years of age and somewhere between 65 to 70% of them are women. 
Um, Spellman girl. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I don't know how much I can say about Spellman. It's uh, it, it was an amazing, amazing four years that I spent there. Uh, the reason that I went to Spellman, first of all, I had a stellar reputation. Um, it was a liberal arts college, which is something that I was interested in. Um, took my English classes at Spelman and took my mass communications classes at Clark College across the street. And my, my stepsister went to Clark, but also Atlanta seemed a safe space for me, for my parents, because my grandmother's father lived in Barnesville, Georgia, outside mm -hmm. of Atlanta. And he had 22 children, 11 by his first wife, 11 by his second wife, 11 boys, 11 girls, and both wives are named Lizzie. True story. So my family, my family populated Atlanta. So my parents knew that I had some cousins to go visit for Thanksgiving, that I was always just a bus ride away from a cousin who could help me out if I needed them. And that was really important. So Atlanta, the city was a big attraction for me and for my parents. And the fact that Spelman had this liberal arts education that was um, just incredible. And I'm just so uh, happy and honored and thankful that I had the opportunity to have those um, liberal arts courses. But also the thing after for all of the girls considering going to Spelman and who are at Spelman right now, here's what you should know. You can run into a Spelman sister 30 years after you graduate and she will embrace you as a Spelman sister. She will be excited that you're a Spelman sister and you will have a friend for life. It's There's a connection to Spelman women that you will always have. And you can reach out to somebody, hey, I went to Spelman. And, it, you know, there's this sisterhood that is, you know, that is really very, very special. Um, I just went to, uh, I just went on a vacation with some of my Spelman sisters. And I, I'm just, it, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful school. And I'm just uh, very honored that I've been a I, I'm a part of the community and I've been able to go back so many times and speak at the school and do some events at the school. Well, you know, it is part of an incredibly legacy consortium. So, I mean, you yourself just referenced attending Spelman, taking one class here, taking another at Clark Atlanta. I, mean, it, 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 I, I know that um, in the, in the spirit of HBCUs, you know, I'm Aggie bred and will be Aggie dead. Uh, I embrace all the HBCUs and, and, and support them all. And wow, wow, wow. I'm just so grateful that you're you're sharing that. There have been a lot of prominent people who've spoken at our guest lecture at uh, Spelman over the years as well. Hey, has there been anybody who really touched you or that you took a message away? Um, well, my gosh, I remember, gosh, I remember at Spelman, we had Coretta Scott King, um, one of my teachers was uh, Christine Ferris. She was at Clark. She was uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s sister. Uh, we've had Nikki Giovanni. We've had- oh, Wait, wait, Nikki, you had, oh yeah. my goodness. Okay, here's an Aggie just blushing over that. Yes, yes. Um, we had, oh my gosh. I think, um, uh, was it Marion Wright Edelman who, was, who came? I mean, we had so many people who came through spell. My graduating, the person who gave us our, our commencement speech, our commencement speaker the year I graduated was Miss Cicely Tyson. Uh, so, you know. My I friend B. Michael's muse. You well, know, B. Michael, yeah, B. Michael yes, is a dear yes. friend of mine. His muse, yes, yeah, Cicely. Yes, 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 Miss Cicely Tyson, absolutely. And um, yeah, and I had a chance to interview uh, uh, Miss Tyson, you know, years later. And I reminded her, I said, you know, yes, you are a commencement speaker. And she was just, I, I just remember her just being so regal. And we were sitting there in Sisters Chapel and there was Cicely Tyson giving us our commencement speech. Yeah. So it was uh, quite extraordinary. We, we, we were at dinner one night. I forget the restaurant in New York. We had several occasions to dine together and all through B, my friend, uh, B. Michael, and 
I remember saying, oh, I've got to tone myself down because I'm one of the 11 kids from the South. When you're from the South at the period of time, I grew up in that uh, neighborhood, Sean, you know, you're going to be yelling anyway, right? We're just loud, right? And then one of the 11, you get louder. And I had, I said, let me just tone myself down. And she didn't speak above a whisper at any time that we were in a personal, I don't know what you experienced, but she was very soft spoken, very, very dynamic and profound. And she turned to me and she said, why would you tone down what you're saying when you speak so importantly? Wow. And I was like, this is the first person who hasn't told me to quiet it down. I, I, I'm so glad you shared her as one of your favorite uh, yeah. memories. When you go back to Detroit, um, do you have anything that you feel you just have to do when you're there or, or oh. are there old things? <laughs> yeah. Detroit has, um, you know, I have a, I, I have a, uh, my father's house. My, my, my father had, before he passed away, a two family flat in Detroit. Uh -huh. And, um, he told me, he said years ago, he said, baby, don't, he said, I'm going to leave this house to you. He said, baby, don't, don't sell this house. Detroit's coming back. Detroit's coming back. Oh boy. I'm saying when I see the Renaissance going on in my city now, it's absolutely extraordinary. I, I mean, I, you know, I just drive around with my friends and my cousins and my mom. We just drive around downtown and just, um, on the east side, I mean, there are like all these new restaurants. We just love mm -hmm. to try new restaurants, uh, black owned businesses um, in, in all parts of the city, which, and we grew up, uh, you know, when we grew up in Detroit, it was common to see black owned businesses, you know, mm -hmm. in the city. And so you knew that you could become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, so I just love, I just love going home. I love, um, now my blood has thinned. I'm not crazy about the cold, but, <laughs> I but just you do like, get to dress cute. You do yeah, get to yeah, dress yeah. cute. I, just, I, I bundle up, you know, and I, yeah, and I always go to church when I'm there. And so it's just, and I just have, you know, tons of friends there. So it's just always nice to be back home. And I still consider it home. I'll say, oh yeah, I'm going home to Detroit. Because, um, you know, I'm a Detroit girl, born and bred. When I'm around L.A., I wear my Detroit versus everybody sweatshirt. You know, I'm just always repping the D. So, yeah, it's a it's um it, it's a wonderful city to be from and to it's you know, it's a city that that built America with the car industry. So. Um, so, yeah, I'm very, very proud to be from Detroit. I think Detroiters, especially uh, Motowners, and you know, my sister and my brother-in-law were Motown. Um, I, I think that Detroiters also helped give the world some of the best images of who America is. And at a time when we didn't really see that ourselves in terms of race relations, but we still had this beautiful music being put out of Detroit and this culture that was being shared to the world. I, I think uh, Detroit is an um, underappreciated city. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. Uh, definitely underappreciated. However, I got to tell you, every week I get calls, texts, emails from people asking me to sell my dad's house. And they're mm -hmm. not coming from individuals. These are corporations that are right. about because right. they're like buying up these properties in Detroit, either to rent or refurbish and resell. Right. Right. So, you know, words out that Detroit's the yeah. place. And, and, and also yeah. when you think about the, when you think about the repatriation of manufacturing and goods and products management, yes. Detroit is key for that. I mean, let's not forget its geography is very healthy for international commerce and for the manufacture of domestic goods. So yes. I, I, I think Detroit is not long before it will have a resurgence, maybe not necessarily from the auto industry, but definitely, definitely, I think it's up. It's on the up. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about those birthday parties your mama used to do? <laughs> well, you know, my, um, so pre-COVID, pre-COVID, mom and I and my sister-in-law, Carolyn, and sometimes my other cousins, we would just go travel the world. We've been all over the country. 
Uh, my birthday's in July, right in the middle of summer. So we would just, you know, uh, just, you know, Greece, Italy, Spain. Uh, we went to South Africa. The year of COVID 2020, we were supposed to be going to Brazil. And obviously that was, that was, yeah. So, you know, we started to do uh, my celebration either in Detroit or LA. And, you know, so yeah, it, you know, for me, birthdays are, um, listen, I remember interviewing, uh, who was I interviewing? Uh, Cameron Diaz. I was interviewing Cameron Diaz and we were talking about age and because we're in a business where a woman's age, you used to be able to hide your age. I remember when I first got to, to access Hollywood back in 1999, you know, I would, <laughs> I would tell people all different types of ages and whatnot. And so, um, uh, Cameron Diaz said, well, you know, I'm going to celebrate my age because the alternative is dead, right? right. So we got to celebrate our birthdays. You know, you don't have to tell what birthday it is, but just celebrate it and just be happy that we're still here. And I got to tell you, we have to, you know, it, it, we just have to grab every little piece of joy out there because, you know, it's easy with so many things going on in the world today to, to, to become depressed. But so you got to grab every little piece of joy that you can. Yeah, pre-COVID, I mean, living was a gift. Post-COVID, I think many consider it a deeper blessing. And so absolutely. And if you are from um, African-American or, 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 or diverse populations, uh, getting to a healthy age is, is, you know, it's, it's quite an achievement for many of us, given, given the things that happen, but you celebrate birthdays so beautifully. It's, it's just wonderful for people to hear your messaging about why that's so. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about TV though, Sean, because I, you got to tell us, do you remember the moment you got the phone call telling you that you got to access Hollywood? Was anybody with you? What, what, what was that day like well, for you? Yeah. I remember I was a reporter anchor in Miami, Florida. Yeah, I was a local news anchor and I had always wanted to be on a national entertainment show. Now remember, this is pre-social media. This is pre-Twitter, YouTube, all that. We didn't have social media back then. So uh, really the concept of being on a national show meant you had to be on a national show. Otherwise they couldn't, nobody could see you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I had started my career in Detroit, Michigan. Um, actually, I really started before that when I was at Spelman, I was chosen to do a, a talk show on, I think it was cable channel 17. Now this isn't cable like, right. you know, cable. this is like Wayne's World cable. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but then I went home to Detroit. I was at a television station there for four years that I went to um, Flint, Michigan. And I was there for two and a half months before the news director told me that I probably wasn't going to make it in TV. And then so right after that, I was there, just like I said, two and a half months. And then I got a job in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the ABC affiliate. I was a medical reporter and um, anchor and uh, hosted a talk show in Milwaukee, then went to Austin, Austin, Texas as a reporter and anchor, and then Miami. And, you know, throughout that time, I was telling people I wanted to be on a national entertainment show like Entertainment Tonight. And there just weren't, you know, I think first Entertainment Tonight was like the only show. And, and you know, even my agent back then said, oh, no, you know, they're not, there aren't that many slots for Black people and Black women. So don't even try, just stay in local news. Don't even try to go on a national show because there just aren't that many slots. And so, I would still, I'd come back to the television station in the middle of the night and put a tape together, like a three quarter inch tape, big tape, mm. resume tape, and then send it out to the different um, headhunting firms and, and, and different shows. And, um, and then I remember I was in Miami at my apartment and uh, I got the call that I had gotten Access Hollywood and I was the first African-American anchor uh, not the first African-American at the station, but um, first African-American anchor there at the show. And then, you know, it was, was, you know, it was like all my dreams had come true. It was mm -hmm. finally all the hard work that I had put in finally paid off. Uh, and then uh, there for uh, 16 years, 
And I think at the time that I left, I don't know if any, I don't know if there was anybody else, but at the time that I left, I was on one entertainment show straight through longer than anyone other than Mary Hart. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was a, it was a very long road, but, but, uh, but fun ups and downs and ups and downs, but, but a lot of fun. And a lot of work ethic. I mean, I, I, I want to know what it meant to you when you won your Emmy for your live coverage of a grand night in Harlem. Now, listen, girl. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly my family. I'm talking my blood family now, John and Elretha's children, okay? We were rooting hard and we were deliriously happy that you were actually awarded for what you had so beautifully earned. Um, obviously, it must have been meaningful, but after all the work you had put into journalism up until that point, it had to have a really special meaning for you. Yeah, you know, it's... um. You, you know, it's it's something that, you know, is always attached to your name, you know, Emmy Award winning journalist. So that's something that, you know, I will carry with me uh, for the, the rest of rest of my life. And it signals uh, an accomplishment. It, um, you know, it's a once again, it's a lot of hard work and it is, um, you know, I'm just really thankful that I had and still have this opportunity to just tell stories about cultures that don't get that type of recognition. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I won the Emmy, and what I remember actually, uh, there are two things that I remember unpacking. Uh, one was my Emmy when it actually came because they actually have to mail it to you. And the other was opening up the box with my book after mm. I read my book and my book was first published. And so mm. opening up the box and seeing my book published for the first time, I was like, oh my God, I literally was like almost in tears. And another time was the Emmy, opening up the box and just holding up the Emmy and just being, you know, just being really proud of that. Well, you, you, Sean, you don't know how many people are impacted by what you do and how many people truly get uplifted by the work that you do. So, girl, mm. you you mentioned one time that uh, you were inspired by Beverly Payne, a uh, true pioneer in Detroit television. Tell us about her. Did you ever get the chance to meet her? And you know, I never got a chance to meet Beverly Payne. Um, when I was my, I went to Catholic school, St. Cecilia's Catholic School on Detroit's West Side. And I was, uh, my grandmother's house was just a few blocks down from the school. So oftentimes I would stay at my grandmother's house, spend the night there to, you know, walk to, uh, you know, walk. And we could walk to school. We could be eight years old and walk four blocks to school by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as mm -hmm. you know, it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Um, and so- A long history ago, a long history ago. A long history ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, I remember, uh, you know, I was watching my cartoons and after, you know, six o'clock, my grandmother would turn on the evening news and I would see this woman, this black woman who I knew was different because she looked like me. Mm -hmm. And she was a, Beverly Payne was the first African-American anchor, I think, in Detroit could have been Michigan, but she was a pioneer in television news. Uh, and it was Beverly Payne. And I just remember just sitting there being mesmerized by her, just looking at her on TV and just not like my little, you know, six, seven, eight year old self didn't realize what it was about her at the time. But I was just sitting there. I was just like, you know, just kind of looking at her. And I, I never met her but she was the first person who set me on a path to becoming a journalist. And mm -hmm. there are so many, I just still today, I still, you know, meet so many young women, older women who say, you know, I was grew up watching you and you helped me realize that I could do it, that it was a possibility for me. And so that's, you know, one of the things with, um, 
you know, with, with my foundation that I hope to have girls see themselves and know that they can do it. You know, even if they don't see somebody who can do it, they know that they can do it. You know, you're, you're right. Um, for me, it was Jet Magazine, mm -hmm. Sepia Magazine. And I'm talking your mama's media yes. that she would have seen as a girl, right? Uh, at 70 years of age, um, I, 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 was, I was reading the magazines that the, uh, the, that the uh, uh, Georges would bring in on the trains and because yeah. uh, they weren't sold in the stores in my small community. And I remember Yvonne Burke being on the cover. Mm -hmm. And when I came to L.A. and I actually got to meet her and subsequently became friends with her, I was blown away. It did something for me that achieving just on my own could not have done. And I think that's the connection that you're making for people right now. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. You know, you've met with an interview so many celebrities who kids look up to for good and for bad reasons. And Sean, you yourself are incredible, incredible as a role model for young girls of all ethnicities and cultures especially for African-American girls there and black girls. There are celebrities who by their right aren't great role models. And I'm not going to ask you about them. I promise. What I do ask you though, are there any female celebrities who you point to and say they're currently being great role models? Uh, let's see. Uh, fe well, I mean, I, you know, I look at somebody like, um, M you know, M Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know she's not, you know, not a, in the sense of like artists or actors or, or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I look at her because she has uh, overcome some incredible challenges. Um, I like her message of giving back and em empowering girls and young women. I, I find that to be, um, like I said, that's, that's my North star right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I, I definitely look up to her and she just, she's just gracious. And I mean, I just, you know, I, I like, I think she's just very classy and just likes, you know, when I'm sure she'd like to say one thing, she just keeps it classy and just, you know, keeps it moving. And yeah, so she's all about, you know, empowering uh, girls and, and, and women. So I really like that. Like in terms of, you know, actors or actresses, um, you know, it, you know, it's so, it, we've had this conversation about, you um, especially artists, female artists out there. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, well, why do they do this? Or why do they, you know, why do they, you know, portray themselves this way, da, da, da. You know, before we see an artist on the stage at an award show, the award show producers saw the performance. The studio knows what the performance is. And, you know, we, you know, we tend to point to artists and say, you know, why are they making those particular choices in terms of their craft? And I'm not sure if this is where you were, you know, where you were going or not, but I'm just, I'm just saying, we have to start looking at what are, what, what are the parameters that the decision makers give women and young girls to be successful. If they say, okay, you know what? We'll sign you to, okay, but what you got? Show us what you got. Oh no, we need something a little bit more risque than that. We need somebody, you know. So we have to start looking at those conversations that happen before they hit the stage, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, a, that's definitely a bigger conversation. And, and, and that happened in music as well, a lot. Yes. That's what I'm, you know, yes, that's what I'm get talking back about. in the studio and put more on it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you really, really nailed it there. And that is what I was asking you to really share. So thank you for doing that beautifully. Um, I, I, I know we could talk forever. We don't have forever to talk. There's one thing before we do four for four and before we close up on another question I have about Sean Foundation I want you to talk about. And that's your work, your engagement with the adoption process. I know in LA, you're very much respected for the work you do. And are there any bullet points to stand you want to share about the children in LA or elsewhere, uh, especially as our family is international, around considering or getting involved in the adoption process? Oh, so, you know, I used to be a spokesperson for the Share Your Heart, Share Your Home um, foster care uh, program for the county. It was a wonderful time that I was, I was, um, when I was serving with them. And, you know, I remember, I will never forget that, you know, when the representative was telling me about these adoption fairs and where these kids that, um, you know, they would come to the, the different fairs and hope they would get chosen by a family. I mean, and it was just, I, like, it really just brought me to tears. And that was one of the reasons why I had, had gotten involved to help these kids find families. Um, you know, you th and I have friends who have adopted. I have friends who are adopted. I, you know, it's, um, you know, the fact we talk about how important family is and there is, there is nothing more philanthropic than to share your home with a child that does not have one. And so, you know, if that's something that is in your heart, if it's something that you have the ability to do because you do have to have the right, you need the right infrastructure to be able to do it. So, you know, I encourage anyone who is uh, considering uh, adoption to, you know, just to, just to reach out and see what the process is like, ask other parents who have adopted and who knows, there might be a very special bond there one day. Yeah, you share your home today, they may own their home tomorrow. Yes. You know, yes. I, I, I think it's beautiful. Hey, Sean, if I'm your fairy godmother, who do you want me to bring as a guest for you to talk with on camera who you've not talked with? Who would you really love? Um, is this living or dead or if it just, just the this living? This is living right now. Just this is living. Real. Okay. Who I've never, gosh, I've talked to a lot of people. You're my fairy mm -hmm. godmother. Who would you bring that I would want to talk to? Um, you know who I would, you know who I would love a conversation with? Um, I would like to talk to Nikki Giovanni. I'd actually like to talk to Nikki Giovanni. I saw yeah. her. Like, yeah, you know, I told you she came to Spelman when I was a student there, but then she came, I saw her someplace else. And I was like, this is a deep sister. I would love to be able to talk to oh her. Oh my gosh, she is. Her. When I was at A&T, I listened to her on vinyl. Nikki Giovanni and the Last Poets. Those were, those were my go-tos in those moments. On YouTube, there is a conversation between Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin. Oh, okay. I'm going to go find that. If you find it, please share the link, but I will look for it. I will look for it. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to do four for four and, 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 and close this thing, this conversation out. Uh, as we approach that, please just tell us one more time, what is the best way for people to support Sean Foundation? We're starting a new year and people want to know how they can be involved, Sean. Yes. So you can go to seanfoundationforgirls.org and click donate. Uh, there's all kinds of ways you can give your credit card, you can send a check, you can do debit, anything. We take all sorts of money. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's, just that it's, it's literally just that easy. Just go to the seanfoundationforgirls.org and click donate. And it'll tell you how you can help support our mission uh, to help underserved and underrepresented girls. And we are sharing those links for you guys right now. Okay, Sean, let's do four for four.
Okay. So I'm going to ask you four questions. You're going to give me four answers. Um, and uh, you'll, so the first of four, we're going one for four, is you get to invite anybody to dinner, living or dead, uh, who's going to be at your table and why? My daddy, because I miss him so much. Um, I hear his voice all the time. And, you know, when I'm having struggles and, and uh, trials, I hear his voice all the time, but I would just love to give him another hug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Second person. Oh, four I get people. another person? Oh, four okay. people at the table, four people. Oh, I get four people at the table. Okay. Then, <laughs> wow, okay. So my dad, um, my grandma Curry, <laughs> And my mama Ashi, so that's my dad's mom. Your grandma who made the peach preserves? Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then my mama Ashi, who is my <laughs> mother's mom. So dad, grandma Curry, uh, mama Ashi. And then I would have, you know, I'd have my stepdad, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, that would be beautiful. That would be beautiful. Okay, we're going two for four. Okay. What are you listening to right now? And uh, why did you share it with the family here? Okay, um, right now, I'm just listening to Christmas music because I just decorated my house, decorated, put all my decorations up. And I'm so I'm just looking, listen to various Christmas music. It could be anybody, Mariah Carey. Uh, I heard a little, some Smokey Robinson, the Temptations. <laughs> Yeah, that's Three. soulful Christmas music. Okay, so it ain't Christmas until you hear the Temptations, right? Right, yes. Black Christmas yes. doesn't start until you hear the Temptations. <laughs> and who's your fourth one? You got Mariah Smokey. Mariah you got the Temptations. Smokey. Um, okay, who sung, um, is it set? Chestnuts Roasting on a Rope of Rock? Who's Nat King Cole. The Nat, Nat King Cole. Cole. The Nat King Cole. Done, done, paid in full. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what books are you uh, recommending to our family to read and why? So, okay. Well, well, you can always went, read exactly as I am. Okay, mm -hmm. pull that one out. Okay, I'm reading uh, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, yeah, extraordinary, extraordinary writer. Uh, who won the Pulitzer Prize, not for this book, but for um, uh, for another book. Um, so Cast is another one. Um, mm -hmm. Atomic Habits. And oh my gosh, I cannot remember. I'm going to have to because see who the author is. Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits teaches you, you know, the habits that can bring you success. Okay. The habits that can bring you success. Maybe somebody can Google that. Uh, right quick and tell me who wrote Atomic James Clear? Yeah, James, James Clear. Clear. James Clear, mm -hmm. Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have mm -hmm. Asked by Isabel Wilkerson. We have Exactly As I Am uh, by Sean Robinson. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Atomic right. Habits by James Clear. Oh, and um, Michelle Obama's new book, uh, The Light We Carry. Yeah, fantastic. That that I mean that's fantastic. That'll kick a year off like nothing. Yes. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're going four for four, Sean. Okay. Here we go. All right. Give us this family four pieces of the best advice you want to share with them. And if it's advice given to you by someone, pay homage and tell us who it was. Importantly, yeah why you think this is important. Okay, so number one, as I mentioned, I always hear my dad's voice. And he, when I get overwhelmed, which is quite often, um, my dad will say, babe, take it little by little. Just take it little <laughs> by little. And then what happens is I stop, I kind of reset, and then I just, you know, I'm not going to clear all the papers on my desk, but I can clear one. OK, I can just tackle one of them. So that's what I do. Um, oh, my God. Sean, Sean, your dad's saying take it little by little. I know you realize this. It bears saying out loud. 
Sean Foundation does that. You take little by little and you get it. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Little by little. Um, mm. and, and, you know, uh, dad gave so much advice. Another piece of advice, because I live by his daily advice. Uh, his um, mm -hmm. Another piece of advice dad gave me, and I wrote about this in Exactly As I Am. It says, baby, a setback is a setup for a comeback. A setback is a setup for a comeback. And that kind of speaks for itself. You know, you think you had a setback, but then it just may take you a minute, get yourself together and, you know, start gearing up to get yourself back in the race. You know, whatever that race is. I love that it. race isn't I against other people. That race is within you. I yeah. love it. Yes. So, so that's, um, so that is a piece of advice. Um, well, okay. So here's a piece of advice that I give my friends, especially my girlfriends. And the reason I am mentioning this one is because they always come back to say to me, Sean, you were right about this. 100% of the time, they say, Sean, that piece of advice is spot on. Okay, and it's this, this is advice. Never believe the picture, okay? <gasps> oh, wow. Let me tell you something. Oh, wow. I'm talking about Instagram and all that. And oh, this looks like such a beautiful picture. And I go, don't believe the picture. And inevitably, inevitably, something will happen. I said, told you, don't believe the picture. <laughs> okay. Never believe the picture. Wow. It may be in focus, but don't, just don't. And really, it's don't get caught up in the picture. Because yeah. the picture might not be what's happening. Okay. Mm, mm, right. Mm, so right. That smile. That smile ain't always, <laughs> it ain't always the front of joy, is it? <laughs> I could, I, yeah, there, there are a million stories about never believing the picture. Um, and, you know, uh, let's see, I, I would say, um, I'm going to go back to that advice that Oprah gave me in Exactly As I Am. Exactly As I Am has a lot of advice and it is, mm -hmm. uh, but you are valuable because you're born. You don't need validation mm -hmm. from anybody else. Nobody, nobody has to give you validation. It's all that you are valuable because God put you here. Wow. Sean Robinson, from my heart to your home. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>